A firearm is not designed to accept a specific magazine of a specific size. Magazines come in all ranges and sizes. I'm very concerned that this wording in an open-ended way could lead to the uh, banning of a large number of uh, hunting, semi-automatic hunting rifles and shotguns. Uh, what I see here, I, I am a gun owner. And I, I have trust issues as a gun owner, frankly. Charter statement was done on the original bill, this new amendment. Uh, it wasn't, but there was analysis done, fully acknowledging you can't share it, but you did, a charter analysis was done on this amendment. Is there anybody here that's qualified to answer that question? I call this meeting to order. Welcome to meeting number 64 of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Public Safety and National Security. We will start by acknowledging that we are meeting on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people. Today's meeting is taking place in a hybrid format pursuant to the House Order of November 25, 2021. Members are attending in person, in the room, and remotely using the Zoom application. Pursuant to the Order of Reference of Thursday, June 23, 2022, the Committee resumes consideration of Bill C-21, an act to amend certain acts and to make certain consequential amendments firearms. The Committee resumes the debate on clause on Amendment G-3-2, and I will now welcome the officials who are with us once again today. From the Department of Justice, we have Marianne Brees, Counsel, Criminal Law Policy Section. Paula Clark, Counsel, Criminal Law Policy Section. Phaedra Glushek, Counsel, Criminal Law Policy Section. From the Department of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, Rachel Mainville Dale, Acting Director, General Policy, uh, Firearms Policy. From the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, uh, Mr. Rob Daly, Director, Strategic Policy, Canadian Firearms Program. Ms. Kelly Paquette, Director General, Canadian Firearms Program. Thank you for joining us again. Um, we look forward to your valuable contributions as we proceed. So we will continue the speaking list from uh, last, our last meeting. Uh, Mr. Motts had the floor, however, he's not present. So we will continue with Mr. Moff, followed by Madame Michaud, followed by Mr. Julian. Uh, Ms. DeMoff, please, if you will. Thank you, Chair. Um, we had a, an extremely uh, frustrating meeting last meeting in that we were... Um, in that we were two and a half hours discussing the amendment that I've put forward and numerous other things which are not even part of this bill. So I am hopeful that... Today, we'll, we'll be able to move a little bit more uh, efficiently um, because there are really important things in this bill beyond the amendment, and colleagues know that when it comes to police services and access to goat guns, whether it's um, uh, instances of, of gender-based violence and prohibition orders and um, also increasing the, the um, sentences for... Um, firearms offenses that are listed to organized crime. So, you know, we 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 have 146 ish, 150 amendments in front of us here today. I recognize that a number of them are. Um, hopefully, we can go through fairly quickly. But I'm hoping we can be efficient and um, and get through this in at a relatively. Um, quick pace. So I, I'll leave it there right now, Chair, until we hear from, from some of our colleagues and see how the meeting's going to go today. Thank you, Mr. Moff. We go now to Madame Michaud. Allez-y, s'il vous plaît. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Um... Thank you very much, Chair. I'd like to thank, of course, uh, our witnesses for being here today. Uh, it's been a long haul the last few weeks, and uh, we have to understand that no uh, definition will be available. And at the Blanc, we understand the difficulty of creating a defini definition that will please everyone. Uh, 
<clears throat> regardless of what they we're going to come up with, they're going to have uh, five different interpretations of how it should be interpreted. Uh, the designations might be all different. And nonetheless, uh, as I said at the last meeting, I'd like to uh, recognize the courage uh, of the government in withdrawing their last uh, amendment and uh, uh, undertaken consultation with various groups, which should have occurred since the beginning. We've also been consulting on our side, <clears throat> and we've had uh, proposals of definitions which are quite different with everybody that we consulted. It's not an easy task. But I believe we can try to uh, improve the definition nonetheless. I'd also like to underline that in the French version, uh, a hunting gun, or fusil de chasse, uh, is a very common expression. And it's not bad to use it, because a lot of hunters will recognize it. So it was simplification, common, common language, if you will, and it will uh, assist in communicating with the public. The definition is acceptable for that particular uh, firearm. We might be able to improve it further, <coughs> uh, depending on the comments and co uh, advice that we've received, and of course, with the assistance of the uh, uh, officials that are here today. I'm sure a lot of people are watching us today, uh, people who are interested in hunting, civil society, the indigenous population. So we have to make this the best law possible so that we can try to satisfy as many people as possible, all the while maintaining public safety. Now, uh, there is point uh, one, two uh, with the... Uh, Detachable uh, multi-cartridge multi uh, charger, magazine, I should say. Uh, a weapon will become immediately illegal if somewhere in Canada someone decides to uh, sell a high-capacity magazine uh, for uh, these uh, weapons. Now, the intention of the uh, manufacturer is quite unknown. Uh, There is usually a magazine that accompanies every weapon, and it's usually not a high-capacity magazine. However, they could, in fact, have one uh, with five cartridges uh, in Canada, magazine capacity, and another one for uh, other markets, uh, 40 uh, cartridges or uh, bullets. I'd like to know how we might determine if the uh, manufacturers... Uh, intention has not been initially to provide a 30, uh, 30 charge magazine with these assault type weapons or I'm not, I'm not sure if it's out of the box that way but I'm and uh, I was wondering how we might deal with that So every firearm in their specifications, uh, designs, they will identify w what cartridge magazine is intended for that firearm. So um, in the ones that, uh, and they're all over the map, like some of them can come out with 2, 4, 10, 20. Others are <clears throat> originally designed just for 2 and 4. Um, it really depends on the manufacturer or the designer of, of a firearm and the firearm itself um, of what type of cartridge magazine it will be designed for. Thank you for that. Now, uh, when we're talking about ca classification or categories, there's no uh, regulatory. If a weapon has already been classified as uh, non unrestricted, what factor uh, would you insist on? If there's no, if there's no statutory or regulatory changes, uh, are there other factors involved in the classification? 
So this defin <coughs> definition would be prospective, so it would be for the future. Um, but given the classifications today, um, it does not take a cartridge magazine into consideration for classifying a firearm as non-restricted, restricted, or prohibited. Thank you. And for an example, perhaps uh, in Canada, if we have a charger of four cartridges in the United States is being sold with a 20 cartridge magazine, is there a mechanism, a process by which we could review the classification in the context that there has been no uh, regulatory or statutory changes? If I understand the, the question correctly, I, um, if I may, I, I'll ask it back just to make sure I, I'm understanding it correctly. So is there a mechanism um, for, and this I guess would be outside of a design, so a firearm is designed for a four, but then later on it's, it's um, identified to also, or a new cartridge is developed that also fits that firearm that is a 20 that could be used in the United States? And is there a mechanism for us um, to regulate? I, th I, th I think that's what I'm hearing. De revoir la classification de l'armée. To, to review the classification, uh, because now it can, it's, a, it's... Original design, right now, the way that it's written, uh, it wouldn't be considered. Je vous remercie. Le deuxième aspect... The second uh, issue I'd like to deal with is for a weapon which is designed with a magazine of six or more cartridges. And here's what we said about the mass killings in Newfoundland. Uh, all semi-automatic handgun and all semi-automatic rifles and shotguns that discharge center-fire ammunition and the, that are designed to accept detachable magazines with capacities of more than five rounds. La définition du gouvernement... The government definition is very close to that in a way, but there is a few details. They don't talk about the, uh, the uh, possibility of uh, using a magazine with higher capacity, but the design of it on the original uh, magazine, the definition of a semi-automatic weapon could be the, the criteria which decides what it is, whether it is uh, prohibited, restricted, or unclassified by design. Uh, some weapons, of course, no matter what the size of the magazine would be, would be considered uh, either prohibited or restricted whether it was five uh, bullets, and the next month it comes out in a 30 cartridge magazine capacity. Nonetheless, the arm, the weapon, was initially designed and classified as a weapon with a five cartridge magazine. And as Ms. Paquette mentioned, uh, there's the, we have yet to classify all future weapons as we don't know what they are. Uh, Mrs. Bencho uh, was asking at the last meeting, if I understood correctly, uh, <clears throat> they're talking about a prospective uh, definition, so uh, it doesn't yet exist. Now, if we were to use the uh, Commission's uh, definition of a high-capacity magazine could mean an inter, uh, a retroactive uh, prohibition, but the RCMP is not going to reevaluate a classification of any weapons. There's been no uh, changes so far and no retroactivity on these weapons. If we come back to the Commission's recommendation, a high-capacity magazine uh, was used rather than what was provided by the original manufacturer. How are we going to prohibit the entry of these types of weapons that can be so readily adaptable with detachable magazines uh, unless they are designed not to accept a high-capacity magazine? I have a picture, and I'll try to describe uh, the weapon that I'm looking at here, a Browning Mark Bar Three, currently uh, legal in Canada. 
But I give you that as an example as one of the models that could be. It's a semi-automatic, detachable magazine, three or four caliber, whether it's a, a 38 or, or a 303, but cannot ta accept a magazine of higher capacity. There's no ex possibility of having, adding a, a larger capacity magazine. without modifying the weapon itself. In context, it seems that the manufacturer is also proposing high-capacity magazines for its models. Uh, if they were to create a different model for another jurisdiction, he would have to have a different design, particularly as to the magazine uh, is concerned. This is what done with the detachable box magazine to allow for 10 cartridge charge. The definition proposed by the Commission on the mass, uh, <coughs> mass killings in uh, Nova Scotia uh, would be classified with a different number if they had different magazine sizes. And it would be allowed if the original design contains no more than five cartridges to the magazine. The weapon could not be sold in Canada as there is no physical way of uh, inhibiting the modification for a higher capacity magazine. Now, if we come back to those models that is uh, sold in Canada with a detachable uh, magazine, three cartridges or four, the alternate, uh, <clears throat> there are alternative ways of arriving at a higher capacity magazine. And the proliferation of these uh, high capacity magazines uh, uh, would have to be stopped. It has to be, uh, by design, to be impossible to put in a high capacity magazine. The government's argument is that uh, the uh, appearance of this would uh, retroactively reclassify these weapons. Now, eventually, there might be some uh, factors outside of the control of a manufacturer, which is not the way that the gun is supposed to work, and that's not how our classifical system is going to work. Back to the Commission's uh, re recommendation. If a gun or a firearm uh, <clears throat> the size of a magazine depends on the intention of the manufacturer. In other words, he would have to be directed as to what is allowable and not allowable by capacity. Now, the question for manufacturers in order to conform to the legislation, uh, we have to make it explicitly clear. So I'd like a sub-amendment, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to propose a motion to 3G2. The clerk, I believe, has received copies uh, for uh, of this uh, sub-amendment. And I certainly hope that uh, my colleagues will be able to support this sub-amendment, which would be an improvement to this bill, and reply uh, to the concerns of survivors uh, of uh, various incidences in Canada. I could read it out if you wish, or I could wait until everyone has a copy. A short, uh, perhaps you could uh, read it out. It, it, I think it's been distributed by the clerk. Wait, oh, there it goes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Chair. So I think this would be an amendment to the motion that's before us, not a sub-amendment. Alors, l'amendement à la motion, Monsieur le Président, se lit comme tel que la motion... Reads as follows. That G32, proposing the modification of uh, Bill C31 on uh, line 15 of 1, be modified by the following substitution. Uh, uh, initially designed with and with follows. 
uh, originally designed with in subparagraph 84.1c, sub 2, with the following, is designed to accept. Thank you. Now, uh, we are now on the, uh, on the amendment. So the debate shall continue on the motion as amended by Madame Michaud. Uh, and next on my speaking list is um, Mr. Julian, however. I was just going to ask if we could suspend for five minutes to review the amendment, Chair. It's okay. Suspend for five minutes. Save it for later. <laughs> so um, we'll go now to Mr. Julian, I believe, is next on my list. Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Julian, please go ahead. Uh, merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président, uh, et merci pour... Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, and thank you for uh, providing me a few minutes. I've taken a look at this, uh, and it comes back to the language, uh, the wording that we had last November, and I can't support that. In, in November, for example, there were many aspects which were quite ambiguous and unclear. Uh, not too easy to understand exactly what the end purpose was. I think that the department has done a, a good amount of consultation. <clears throat> and uh, while I can understand uh, the sub-amendment, I don't see how it uh, really makes a significant difference to the uh, current uh, Amendment, so I'm going to vote against it. Um, the the issue of of time within this committee, we we've um, accomplished uh, we accomplished in two and a half hours one amendment on on Tuesday. Now, uh, you know as well as I do, in terms of the math, uh, 145 amendments at two and a half hours each, 390 hours. Um, uh, we have uh, I've uh, suggested before that we need more hours. Uh, per week to really engage in this issue, particularly in light of the urgency around ghost guns and the fact that law enforcement is looking for these measures. And so it seems to me, if you talk about uh, uh, that number of hours, 390 hours, and only four hours a week, we're talking about uh, 90 sitting weeks, which would mean, I suggested on Tuesday, uh, that the pace we were going would mean that we wouldn't be completed clause by clause until October 2024. Um, but given that we didn't complete the this, this study at the end of um, or that amendment at the end of the day on Tuesday, we're actually talking, surprisingly, Mr. Chair, about October 2026. It would take about three and a half years at our current pace to go through clause by clause on this bill. And given the importance um, protecting uh, victims of domestic abuse, ensuring that ghost guns are actually tackled at a time we're seeing an exponential rise in the number of ghost guns anecdotally across the country, certainly in the United States, uh, where they compile those statistics. Uh, we're seeing a marked increase in the number of ghost guns, which is why the Biden administration has cracked down. And over 20,000 ghost guns have been seized in the past year. Uh, this, this is uh, an emergency, and I, I agree that the government made a mistake in tabling amendments back uh, in the fall that were not clear and have led to this delay. But I think uh, two wrongs don't make a right. We really need to proceed with this study and, and get the clause by clause completed so that law enforcement has the, the tools it needs to combat criminals who are using ghost guns, untraceable weapons. So I'm hoping I get the unanimous consent on this, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair. What I would like to propose uh, by unanimous consent, because that's the only way it can happen. So we uh, request an additional 20 hours of hearings next week. That would mean 24 hours of committee hearings next week to go through clause by clause. I, I don't believe we can wait uh, years before this bill is finally adopted. We need to move forward. And so uh, I hope we'll get unanimous consent in order to, to do that, to request an additional 20 hours of committee time next week to add to the four hours that are already scheduled. Thank you, Mr. Julian. Um, so I think with a unanimous consent uh, request of that kind, it's not debatable. Is that correct? 
And so we would go straight to a vote. Nay. Do we have, uh, Nay. so we do not have a unanimous consent. Um, thank you, Mr. Julian. We'll carry on now with our list. We go to uh, Mr. Calkin, please. Uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Julian, were you not finished? No, 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 I, I'm putting myself back on the list. Okay, you bet. Uh, no, I, I'll, I was on the list to speak to the main amendment, not the sub-amendment, so I'll, uh, um, I'll uh, ask to be put back on the main amendment speaking list for now. Okay, uh, Mr. Lloyd. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And um, yes, uh, the problem I have with Mr. Julian's unanimous consent motion is that point of order. Is that not decided, and we've moved on now? Yeah, Mr. Julian's motion is defeated. So, no. or it's not a motion. Strictly, it was unanimous consent request. So we're on the sub amendment from Ms. Correct. Michelle. We're debating right? the okay. sub amendment. Thank you. I'm sure the chair will give me a little bit of latitude, but um, we can't judge uh, past, uh, you know past performances and say that's going to be the future so the assertion that we're going to be here until October 2025 is uh, is is ludicrous it's it's not it's not going to happen so um, uh, we'll continue on uh, yeah conservatives will not be in support of the sub amendment as moved by Ms. Michaud thank you Mr. Chair thank you Mr. Lloyd um, Mr. Muff please Thanks, Chair. Um, the, the member who moved this is someone who I have the utmost respect for, and I know she does a lot of work, and I know she knows her subject well, and it pains me to say that we can't support her amendment. Um, however, um, there was a lot of work done to come up with wor the wording that we have before us, and... Um, I have had the unfortunate uh, position of, of amending on the fly at committee on previous bills, and it uh, can have unintended consequences. And I do think that uh, given the, the amount of work that went in and the consultation from the minister and his team to come up with wording that uh, could be supported, I, not everyone is going to agree with it, and, and it, you know, that's, that's, um, that's fine. Um, but unfortunately, we're not able to support the sub-amendment. Thank you, Mr. Moff. Um, Madame Michaud, allez-y, s'il vous plaît. Merci, Monsieur le Président. J'apprécie les... Thank you, Chair. I appreciate my colleagues' comments. I'd like to uh, respond to Mr. Julian, who said my uh, sub-amendment uh, brings us back to a similar text last November. That is true, but at the same time, the November de definition, semi-automatic or a hunting weapon, uh, semi-automatic hunting weapon, that was referred to in that case, center fire, uh, center fire from a, dis a detachable uh, high-capacity whereby the weapon was uh, <clears throat> originally designed. The proposal I'm making as a sub-amendment is that of that of the Commission on the uh, Mass Killings in Nova Scotia. And I would recall that the minister was said he was uh, open to uh, implementing some of these recommendations of that commission. So that's it for my comment, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Julian again. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed by Conservatives uh, not um, allowing for the additional committee hearings that uh, are, are needed around this, given how slow um, uh, they, they have said that they are not engaged in a filibuster. They're honourable members. I know each of them, and I know uh, that they, um, they may not perceive that they're doing a filibuster, but I think... Um, uh, others would see it differently, and certainly uh, looking uh, now at, at coming up to three and a half hours, four hours with, uh, with just one uh, amendment adopted, we can do the math at 145 amendments, uh, and it's exponential. And the other element that's exponential, of course, is the, uh, the, the plague, the epidemic of ghost Point counts heard, on the... Point of order, Chair. Thank you, Chair. 
We're supposed to be debating uh, my sub-amendment and not uh, uh, the one or the one that uh, Mr. Lloyd could not um, uh, express an opinion, so Mr. Julian should be treated the same way. I would uh, suggest, Mr. Uh, Julian, um, t take that into account, please. Uh, absolument, uh, Mr. President. Certainly, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, Ms. Michaud is correct on that point. However, I think it was important to say that this is really not working for the process here. Uh, now, uh, the sub-amendment. I've already uh, said what I wanted to say on that issue. And of course, uh, we'll come back to the uh, question of the uh, actual amendment and once we've disposed with the sub-amendment. So, Mr. Lloyd, you're up on my list next. Um, I guess uh, my question to Christine, uh, Ms. Michaud, um, this potential, like firearms are not designed to accept um, specific, a firearm is not designed to accept a specific magazine of a specific size. Magazines come in all ranges and sizes. Uh, it's not the function of a firearm to determine what the size of the magazine is. It's the function of a magazine to determine what the size of a magazine is. And so I'm very concerned that this wording in an open-ended way could lead to the uh, banning of a large number of uh, hunting, semi-automatic hunting rifles and shotguns. I'm uh, just wondering if Ms. Michaud has considered uh, that this would potentially lead to the banning of, of a large number of hunting rifles and shotguns and what her thoughts were on that. Thank you. Um. Mr. Lloyd, at the end of the list, if anyone wishes to speak again, go ahead. Go ahead, Madame Michaud. I thank Mr. Lloyd for his question, and I just to uh, say that it is a prospective uh, definition, and it may lead to the prohibition of hunting weapons, because it will be applied to weapons that don't yet exist. And if the proposal made by the Commission on the Mass Killings in uh, Nova Scotia, I think they did a, a colossal work, and uh, they have very serious recommendations. Thank you all. There being no further speakers, we'll uh, vote on the sub-amendment. Um, uh, all in favor of the sub-amendment? All opposed? Desolée, madame. The sub-amendment is defeated. We carry on with the debate on the um, on the main amendment. I think Mr. Cockin is on that list. I, I'm trying to maintain a little bit of, um, um, and then Mr. Julian. Oh well, thank you, thank you, Chair. And I, I guess uh, now that we've got the um, the, the sub amendment question resolved, I, I still do have some some questions, and um, I'm hoping the committee and uh, and the witnesses will. Grant me some latitude because I wasn't here uh, for the previous um, discussion on this amendment. But what I see here, I have some, I have some questions. I have some concerns. But I, I am a gun owner, and um, I, I have trust issues as a gun owner, frankly, uh, with a process that provides a definition and yet still provides another way to circumvent the definition. And if I read this amendment correctly in the context of the current law, it simply adds this section um, after section D in the criminal code and the definitions of a prohibited firearm. Uh, and the one clause that would be before it, section D, says any firearm that is prescribed to be a prohibited firearm. So that's the other process. So notwithstanding all of the discussion that we're having about Clause E being added into the prohibited firearm definition in the criminal code under 841, uh, there is still an ad hoc way to declare a firearm, whether it meets or doesn't meet the definition that we're debating today, uh, as a prohibited firearm, as has always been the case. And I think that's what genuinely frustrates law-abiding firearms owners is the stroke of a pen method that somebody somewhere can just arbitrarily use that other process. So I'm just putting on the record, as a gun owner, 
that uh, I am genuinely fr frustrated um, that we're spending so much time discussing a definition for which there is a process to completely circumvent the definition. And that's why I don't have any trust that even if we do come to a general consensus on this definition, that this isn't the only way uh, in which I can, as a purchaser, as an owner, that anybody who is a business owner, anybody who's a manufacturer, there is no way of knowing, there is no way of knowing by reading the law, if this amendment is passed into it, whether or not uh, a long gun will still be prohibited, restricted, or otherwise. So it is frustrating to me, but I have some questions. I have some questions because um, it, it deals with Remington firearms. I'll just use them as an example. Remington is getting back into business. They've made the 742, 740, uh, 7400, and the 750. Um, so for, for the people that are here today as witnesses, can you, you know which firearm I'm referring to, right? It's generally known as, a, as the Remington semi-automatic hunting line of their rifles. It, uh, we all agree on that, correct? Is, is that, do you guys know which gun I'm talking about? So, Ms. Paquette, you, under, you understand that gun. Okay, good. Uh, so, I mean, that gun has obviously been designed. It's been in use for decades. We, we would generally agree with that sentiment, right? So, the 742 was basically replaced in, by, in production by the 7400, which was then replaced by the 750, generally speaking. Would you, would you agree with what I'm saying? I believe that's accurate, yes. Yeah. And you would also agree that Remington designed a four, generally speaking, for all of those models, a four-round magazine, a 10-round magazine, and a 20-round magazine. Now, only the four-round magazine is lawful in Canada, according to our laws. Am I, am I correct in how I'm interpreting that? Yes, but um, I, th I think you're... The definition is just one element, so when they talk about the magazine capacity, it's one element to determine. Okay. I, I, it's not... Don't, don't I, I'm gonna, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to go where you think I'm going to go. Okay. So, okay sorry. <laughs> so, uh, I, the magazine issue is a completely separate issue, in my opinion, and Unfortunately, because we actually don't have clarity, the, the, the first thing that we should actually be getting clarity on before we're discussing any of, these any of these legislative changes should be the one that actually deals with magazines. But all we have right now is what we currently have in regulation plus what the minister has said they're going to do, which means that I'm now guessing as a parliamentarian what that magazine uh, legislation or legislative change or regulatory change might look like. But I, I'm, Remington is now getting back into the business. They've made announcements that they're they're going to create a new line of firearms. Um, I'm assuming that it'll be based, and uh, hypothetically speaking, but I mean, they're not going to reinvent the wheel. If they create a Model 800, small design changes, it's not the 742, it's not the 7400, it's not the 750, let's just give it a number, let's say it's the 800, it's a semi-automatic rifle, they're going to manufacture a four-round magazine, a 10-round magazine, and a 20-round magazine, and introduce it to the marketplace. Is, the, is your interpretation of this piece of legislation, if it came to pass as law, is a Remington 800, if that's what they decide to call it, designed and manufactured on or the day, if, it, if, if, if they come out to the marketplace with that, they get the patent after this becomes law, is that Remington 800 now, because it comes with a four-shot magazine, a 10-shot magazine, a 20-shot magazine, because it'll probably be interoperable on the platforms, as all, almost all the 700 platform is, is that firearm, is your interpretation, and is, would your recommendation and advice to uh, either an order in council or whatever the process be, would your advice be that that, that Remington 800 is prohibited? I don't think the witnesses can speak to their advice, but they can give you answers to your uh, questions about th their interpretation.
Depending on the modifications of the design, so uh, that's number one. We would have to evaluate what kind of design changes are made. If it's a new model, um, it will be applied against the definition, but it depends on what modifications are, are made to the firearm. So I, I, I can't really answer it until you know what changes are made. So now it's not about the firearm, it's about the firearm model. Do I understand your answer correctly? Should have said design. My mistake. Well, it, these, this is important. This is important for firearms owners to know. They, th these are the questions and concerns that I have. So, if that was the case, in theory, if a Remington 800 semi-automatic 30 odd six, because of an interpretation of this clause and an interpretation of the designs, even though it, it, and it's interoperable now, its magazines and everything is interoperable with a Remington 750, a Remington 7400, and a Remington 742, would that put in jeopardy the firearms that are currently owned legally and would hopefully still be legal in this country, um, would it put those models in jeopardy? Because it's just a different... I have had numerous Chevy pickup trucks. They're all 2500s, and they're all Duramaxes, and they're all different over time. This is just a different form of the same thing, is what I'm trying to get at. And if the new form of the same thing is, is prohibited, then I can reasonably presume that the old form of the same thing will be prohibited. Am I wrong? Hi, I'm gonna answer this question, so thank you for your question. And I just wanna recap to make sure we're on the same page. Your example is a new firearm that is designed in the future and produced in the future, yes? That is capable it, of... It might be. It might be the exact same firearm, just marketed differently with a different model number. It might be the exact same thing as the last one that came out. Okay, well, I can speak to the law, and maybe um, Ms. Paquette can jump in if I'm making a mistake. But... Um, the way the, the, the definition is drafted is it's meant to capture any firearm that is capable of receiving a magazine that can hold more than the, the legal limit. So in this case, it would be six or more, right? Okay, so, so that, would include, that would include a firearm that can capture, that, that can accept a, a magazine that has two or four or 10 or 20. So that would be captured. So according to to two, the third part of the the third part of the definition is that all of this has to happen in the future. So it would be a new design, and then manufactured in the future. And would your interpretation of the Caltech Sub 2000 Generation Two be different than the Caltech Sub 2000 Generation One? Okay, I, I, I'm not, I don't have the technical expertise to answer that question. I would defer to the CFP for that. Is there anybody here that's qualified to answer that question? Maybe I'll take a shot. Um, can I just step back to the question? I, I think it's, so existing makes and models, so your 700s, they are not affected by this definition, right? They currently are in the market. They were previously designed. They were previously manufactured. They will continue to exist and not be touched by that definition. We, we're good on that front, right? I believe that's the intent, sir. That, yeah. yeah, okay. So that's the, now, we're to, now we move to the 800 model. And you mentioned that it's built on the same, same, same everything. The same function. If there's not a material change in the design, so again, I'm, I'm going to be hypothetical here, but let's predicate it under the fact that based on how the manufacturer comes out and markets that new model, how it markets, so it basically is it defining it in any way different? Are there improvements being made? Is it really just something that is substantive or not substantive? That so I'm going to give examples. So the mechanical operation changes or is not changed. So are we moving from, um, I don't know, let's say a gas-operated to a, uh, a recoil, 
system. Okay? So there has to be some material change. This isn't, a, this isn't impacted by a color. So your Duramax Dodge trucks that went from a red to green to yellow isn't necessarily the way we interpret the design right now. Like, I'm just interpreting this, right, as you're asking us to. That wasn't my point. I know, but, but, but the reality is... It's a little is, more substantive than that. Well, I mean, it has to be a material change. Okay, so, so just so I'm clear, because if the Remington 800 that is currently being thought up, drafted, designed, gets its patent, and comes to the market two years after this becomes law, mm -hmm. can accept a Remington 750 magazine or any magazine that worked in a Remington 750, any magazine that worked in a Remington 7400, or any magazine that worked in a Remington 742, it would meet the test of number two. Would you agree? Um, it, sorry, repeat that and meet the test of? Um, because Remington yes. manufactures a 410 and 20-shot magazine, even though the four-shot magazine is the only one legal in Canada, my question to you is, if Remington produces a Model 800 semi-automatic that accepts all magazines from the 750, 7400, and 742 platform, with a four of which Remington has made, four 10 and 20 shot magazines, would test number two be met because the Remington 800 is a, however minor the modifications might be, is a new model of the Remington semi-automatic platform, and I know what you're saying is it has to be a substantive enough change, but that's a subjective decision that is made by somebody. We don't know who those folks necessarily are, but in theory, I'm reading, uh, I'm reading clause two as a Remington 800 semi-automatic, 30-odd six, for example, that can accept a 10-shot, 30-odd six magazine, even though it's not legal in Canada, but for the purpose of the law, meets the test. Point, point of order, Chair. It's unfair to ask officials to determine a future determination of a, of a firearm that they, they can't. It's, it, well, they're asking, the officials have answered as best they can, and now they're being asked to determine the eligibility of something that is completely speculation. It's putting them in a very difficult position to be able to say one way or the other when there's nothing in front of them. They've been clear about that. Uh, thank you for the intervention. Um, I do think Mr. Cocken is, is trying to delve into the particulars of the definition, and um, I, I recognize it's very difficult. I think we have a couple of different questions, in, if I may, incorporated in your questions. I think there's a consequence of a derivative design. And secondly, if that derivative design is capable of accepting multiple cartridges, what is the circumstance? Would that, would that be a fair this, summary? This is, yes, and I, and I'm, I just want to be clear. Um, I, I just, and I know I'm not trying to put anybody here in an unfair, I'm not being hostile in any way, shape, or form. Um, and thank you, Chair. Um, your, your language is very articulate. So I'm, I'm trying to take comfort in the fact that if the derivative, let's say the 800, uh, because we have history with that particular firearms manufacturer, we've got the 742 and the changes to the 7400, and we've got the changes from the 7400 to the 750. I mean, those are very mo I mean, Remington has not reinvented the wheel, let's be honest. So that's why I pursued that line of questioning as our hypothetical example, and I understand, but I have to predict what this law is going to do in the future. That's my job as a parliamentarian, is knowing how changing the law affects the future. So I have to ask hypothetical questions. I think they're as fair, and I'm being as fair and reasonable as possible. I actually believe that if Remington came out with an 800 model that was very, that had as minor changes to it as the 7050 did with the 7400, I believe that because Remington originally designed cartridge magazines with 10 and 20 rounds in it, that test two would be met. But it has to meet all three, right? We already know that it meets test one because it discharges center fire ammunition in a semiotic manner. We all, a manner. We all agree that it meets test one. I think it meets test two. So the only hope for Remington then to get 
the Remington 800 on the marketplace in Canada would be that it doesn't meet test three. And if it's designed and manufactured, that model, and I think we've had this discussion about the model, if that model is designed and manufactured on or after a day in which the paragraph comes into force, and the example I gave you was that model is designed and comes onto the marketplace after this comes into force, is, is that Remington 800, in my, in my opinion, you're going to have a hunting rifle that is now that is now prohibited in Canada. Am I missing something, or is there some way? I think, Mr. Uh, 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 Mr. Rob, I think you, it's, it's uh, Mr. Daly. I, I know that I'm having fun. Um, Mr. Daly is. Is there some way? Because it would it would be nonsensical to have virtually have an identical firearm, a Remington 800 branded prohibited or t labeled prohibited and a model seven a model 750 which is virtually identical be legal in in canada are we going to have that scenario potentially is or how would you how would the law be interpreted so that something that seemingly asinine wouldn't happen well i, I think hanging on your words of virtually identical is a bit of a, a challenge because then i would say if i if i take that for face value there's not a new design here so it doesn't meet test three. That's how I, I get, and I think that's the best I can do in a, in a hypothetical situation, right? Ver, again, it comes back to the determination of whether or not this is actually a new design post this coming into force. See the word new anywhere in the amendment. In regards to a design. Yeah. Am I missing something? Yeah, what we, we did have the, the, the issue in test three was the original design, right? So I'm, I'm referring to then the opposite of well, that, That's what I need. I need to know yeah. how the interpretation and how the implementation right. of the so interpretation. So if this model work. that you're speaking of, the 800, right? Um, okay. If it is a virtually identical, right, then we would be using the original design specs. The okay. Original. What? What would you say, based on your experience and knowledge of how the program has been administered over the years, how significant would the design have to change in order to be considered then a new design? Is there, is there, is there some examples that you can, because I brought up the Caltech Generation 1 and the Caltech Generation 2, virtually the same firearm, other than, the, actually I think the stock is all that really, or the, the way the stock works is all that really changed. Um, is there, can you give me an example of, of, of would it have to be a, going from a gas operated to a, like, I don't see that to be a significant change, but maybe you do, I don't know. It could be that. I mean, I think it would have to be taken in, in a number of different uh, criteria, right? So I, I gave some examples of, of the mechanical operation. Um, it, could, it could be other things. It could be the size, the change in the frame size as well, the receiver frame size. That could have an impact as well that would precipitate potentially us looking at it as a new design. Again, it's difficult to run hypotheticals through at this level, but again, I, you know, I, I think we've given some examples of what would precipitate us to look at this as a new design. It would also be how the manufacturer is pushing out the material in their literature, right? Also, to how they're describing this firearm. So I think it's a combination well, it, of several features and factors that will go into making that determination. I can't just give you one specific feature and say, as long as they meet that, then they're in or they're out. And it would normally be either the manufacturer or an importer that would uh, that would send you uh, a firearms reference table, um, or or be applying for a firearms reference table uh, ruling on the classification. Is that is that not how that works? Yeah, or a designer, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and we would follow up. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Conkin. We go now to Mr. Julian. Go ahead, please. Uh, th thanks, Mr. Chair. I mean, we're now coming up to four hours on this, uh, on this uh, amendment, um, and I, I flag uh, two things. I mean, I've already mentioned the incredible length of time it would take uh, to get through clause by clause on this schedule. I, I note that I proposed a pathway that the Conservatives have rejected, which was to uh, request additional com committee time next week. Mr. Lloyd, on a point of order. This isn't on the subject of the amendments. This is on the subject of his unanimous consent motion, and I think he should get back to the topic at hand. Thank you. Um, 
thank you for your intervention. Uh, I think it is it's certainly pertinent to committee business. I think he's moving along into the amendment itself. Well, it is absolutely appropriate, uh, Mr. Chair, to speak of the time uh, that has been spent on this amendment. Uh, absolutely appropriate, as the member knows. Uh, the, the amendment itself is seven sentences. It was received uh, uh, days ago. Uh, I'll, I'll recall getting 500-page omnibus legislation uh, during uh, the Harper government years uh, that we were debating 24 hours later. And now we're days later, and a seven-sentence amendment is, is uh, not, not being moved through at a time when we have 145 other amendments waiting after that. So it is pretty clear to me that what we are experiencing is a full-on uh, filibuster. And given the size and scope of the important issue around ghost guns and what law enforcement are calling for, I think that's a real problem. And I, I think um, we'll have to find other solutions to, to this filibuster. Uh, on the amendment itself, it is very clear. I thank the officials. They've been very clear in terms of, of answering the questions. Uh, to my mind, in some cases, we're talking about questions that have been repeated or that are rhetorical, and hypothetically, when we know that we have legislation and regulation follows and then things are implemented, um, to go to the point where we're asking uh, questions that uh, are more properly in the, in the latter stages after the passing of the legislation, I, I, I don't feel that's the right, right way to go. So I, I flag the incredible amount of time um, that has uh, taken this week at a time when the committee should be moving forward. And um, I think if, if the Conservatives are not willing to schedule additional committee meetings, I think we have to find other solutions to this. I'll be voting in favour of this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Julian. On y va maintenant, Madame Michaud. Allez-y, s'il vous plaît. Thank you, Chair. I'm a little disappointed that my uh, sub-amendment was refused, but uh, I must say that the definition that we have before us is um, acceptable this, for this reason, that uh, I will probably bend towards uh, accepting it. Uh, I think the members have um, got answers to their questions, and we're almost ready to go to a vote on this uh, particular amendment. It's been a long time we've been waiting for this legislation, and of course uh, we hope that it can move forward more smoothly after this one. Thank you. Mr. Lloyd. Followed by Ms. DeMoff. Mr. Lloyd. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and perhaps uh, uh, Ms. DeMoff's uh, intervention might not be necessary, but uh, we'll see. Um, the conservative position is, is that this definition remains flawed uh, for many reasons, including the reasons just eloquently brought up by my colleague, Mr. Calkins. There's, there's some uncertainty in this uh, definition. And the definition also does leave it open that hunting rifles and shotguns will be banned on a go-forward basis. Also, this government has seemingly left the door open uh, through a proposed advisory council and a mandated parliamentary review on a definition. And so we don't know. Uh, what those will recommend, but it's certainly leaving the door open for a future revised definition that uh, would go forward and ban hunting rifles and shotguns. And we should remember what the Prime Minister did say not too long ago, that, quote, there will be some guns that we have to take away that will be used for, that are used for hunting purposes, end quote. So Conservatives will continue to hold this Liberal government to account. We will continue to stand up for law-abiding hunters and sport shooters so that their hunting rifles and shotguns will not be taken away. And uh, in order to assuage the concerns that Mr. Julian has brought up on numerous occasions, I will say that uh, Conservatives are ready uh, to vote on this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lloyd. Ms. DeMoff. Thank you, Chair. I just want to get on the record and clarify this amendment in front of us will not ban hunting rifles. And to speculate on future um, firearms that may or may not be banned and give the impression that we're um, trying to ban hunting rifles, ban 
uh, these are these are firearms that don't exist. So uh, you know there, there there tends to be clips that get out there, often including me, um, that then give the impression that we're doing something that we're not. So we are not banning hunting rifles. So I want to be very clear on that, and I do want to thank colleagues for. Um, the, the work that we've put into this, and I'm pleased to hear that we're going to get to a vote, so I will end it there. I would like a recorded vote, though, Chair. Very well. Uh, Mr. Clerk, would you carry out the vote, please? Ms. Damoff? Yes. Mr. Cheng? Yes. Mr. Gahiyu? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Mr. Shifke? Oui. Oui. Yes. One second. My apologies. Mr. Ruff? Against. Mr. Lloyd? No. Mr. Shields? No. Mr. Calkins? No. Madame Michaud? En favor. Mr. Julian? En favor. In favor. Seven in favor, four against. Thank you all. So the motion uh, carries. I know we all have the bruises. Thank you all for getting us there. Uh, wouldn't that be nice? Okay, in that, in that, uh, in that uh, vein, we, um, we have until 6, but I think if we go to quarter to 6, it will be the full two hours that we were allocated. Is that okay to everyone? Yeah, okay. Um, so, carrying on, um, next on our list is NDP motion, NDP 0 0.1. And I will note that uh, if this motion is adopted, BQ2 and CPC2 cannot be moved because they, they affect the same line. Uh, Mr. Julian, if you please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I'll be, I'll be brief. I, I will flag that the original uh, NDP member of this committee, uh, Alistair McGregor, has proposed this uh, amendment, and it is, it is his birthday today. Uh, so I hope that that uh, is additional incentive for, uh, for members of the committee. Uh, I'm sure he would be pleased, as would the Airsoft community. I mean, uh, we're, we're talking about very serious issues here. We have uh, a framework in terms of the bill. I mentioned previously the issues around Airsoft, uh, the issues around the manufacturer's loopholes that are, we, would be tightened up with the um, amendment that we've just just adopted. These are important and serious issues. Uh, what has been flagged by Airsoft, um, the Airsoft community, and these are folks that uh, enjoy um, Airsoft the uh, recreational way, and, and is the concerns around uh, the bill uh, treating them in what is really uh, not an appropriate way. Uh, the intent of the amendment would be to uh, take uh, Clause 1 out, and basically uh, that still allows uh, members of the government, the, the government to look at a, a possible regulatory approach. We understand that uh, the government does have the ability to set regulations. Members of the Airsoft community have been very open, as you know, Mr. Chair, in coming before this committee, and in talking with members of, uh, of this committee the, to say that they're open to regulations around Airsoft. But the reality is uh, the current uh, Clause 1 uh, would have a serious impact on Airsoft practitioners, uh, as well as a number of businesses across the country. And so on, on behalf of Alistair McGregor, who's been a strong champion, of, uh, of those who are airsoft practitioners, I'd like to move the amendment, and hopefully it will receive support from uh, all members of this committee. Thank you, Mr. Julian. Is there any discussion on this amendment? Mr. Moff, go ahead. Um, thank you, Chair, and, and I do want to thank um, Mr. Julian on behalf of Mr. McGregor, because I do know he did a lot of work on this. Uh, I would like to give a shout-out to the airsoft industry who... Um, were incredibly willing to work 
uh, to work with us to regulate the industry. I do have concerns about gas-powered airsoft rifles. Uh, it was something that we saw at the gun vault, and I do have concerns about those, the ability of those to be converted. Um, while we won't be able to support the amendment, we won't stand in, uh, in your way, um, because I do, my understanding is the government can provide regulations. And the, as you had mentioned, Mr. Julian, the industry came here and told us that we're fine if you regulate age. We're fine if you look at regulating transportation and storage. We don't want these um, airsoft to get into the hands of kids and to be taken to a school and having a child um, killed because they're carrying their, their parents' airsoft rifle. So, so um, I, I do want to thank the industry sincerely because they were incredibly um, good to work with and were very concise and came with solutions. And I thank you for bringing this forward, Mr. Julian. Uh, Madame Michaud, how is he? Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je remercie, uh... Thank you, Chair. I thank Mr. Julian uh, for his comments and uh, Mr. McGregor, for whom we worked with, uh, with whom we worked with during the other committee. And as Ms. Demoff has just said, uh, we can see to what point, uh, according to the RCMP, to convert a near soft type uh, weapon into a true weapon that can actually be adapted quite easily. And um, I think it's quite uh, e extreme to uh, ban airsoft weapons uh, in C-21. They, were, they came before us. Uh, they were quite open to be regulated and come under regulation. And Mr. Brian Mack, uh, well, anyway, the representative of Airsoft Canada, when he appeared before us, said that the best way to reduce risks would be to uh, ban the sale of these uh, compressed air or gas-fired uh, weapons uh, to uh, youth and to persons under 18 years of age, and of course uh, to uh, educate parents as to the important risks, uh, perhaps even resulting in uh, fatality in the use of these, even if they're using BBs. They're prepared to go further, and uh, self-regulatory uh, regime like the one in uh, the UK, which is uh, analog uh, organization, uh, it should be used only in a range that's devoted to BB, uh, BB using weapons. The measures uh, proposed uh, also uh, correspond to the Airsoft Quebec uh, Association, the same with uh, Airsoft BC and the Association of the Munitions, the FAA. We would propose to the government to uh, encourage Governor and Council to uh, co uh, cooperate and consult uh, more closely with uh, these associations uh, for compressed air weapons and convince the, uh, with them to uh, find a solution to this issue. I have a question for the officials that are here today. Can they confirm that there does exist a possibility today uh, for the government to regulate airsoft weapons without them being mentioned specifically in Bill C-21? Is there not another way out, if you will, to regulate airsoft weapons, but not by including them in his bill? Well, we'd have to do a more fulsome uh, analysis as to the uh, policy repercussions uh, of that particular proposal. I suppose it is doable. Anything is possible with the correct political will. Thank you. Given that it would be possible to do so, I would like to propose a, uh, a sub-amendment which would allow uh, the government to uh, regulate uh, these uh, category. As you say, anything is possible. I would vote in favor of Mr. Julian's uh, motion. Uh, I was going to present the same amendment uh, that would uh, 
uh, remove uh, any mention of airsoft in this particular law, bill, I should say. No, okay. no, Mr. President. No, I don't need to at this point. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Lloyd, if you please. Uh, thank you. Um, this is going to be a question to officials. So I do note that the um, legislation that is seeking to amend does draw a distinction between replica firearms and antique firearms. So it does not apply to antique firearms as far as I understand. Um, and antique firearms, the definition is a firearm that was produced before 1898. That seems to be the date. Um, now, we received a uh, witness testimony, a brief from the Art Toronto Artillery Foundation. And the Toronto Artillery Foundation operates um, a number of old, but these are World War II era, so that'd be post-1898, 25-pounder uh, cannons, um, which are used for, you know, uh, ceremonial public purposes. Um, you know, these have, I think, tremendous value um, for ceremonies. We have the 21-gun salute here on Parliament Hill, um, you know, as a tourist attraction. And so I just want to get some... some, uh, some explanation from the the witnesses here um does this uh impact these 25 pounder uh would they be classified as firearms they wouldn't be given an exemption under antique um what is the state of these canons in the legislation in this in this amendment there's nothing in the amendment that changes the current law around antique firearms but it's not an antique firearm sorry so your question is? Because it's a World War II era, so that's 1939 to 1945, so it's not covered under antique firearm. Right. Okay. It's not technically a, like maybe it's a replica firearm, but this, these are real cannons, I believe. Um, and I believe under the jewels and the bore diameter, could these firearms be banned under, under an amendment like this? So as, as the, the proposed amendment, if these were actually regulated firearms. So if they had, um, if they had a velocity over 152.4 meters per second and had a muzzle velocity in excess of 5.7, and they, they, so if, if they, if that's what they had, then they would be firearms, regulated firearms. And if you had a, a, um, a replica of a regulated firearm, then they would be prohibited. So the, 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 the example that you gave would have to exactly resemble a, a, a what your example is, a, it would have to exactly resemble a regulated firearm. In order to be exempt? In, in order to be captured. Okay. So it, if, if your example does not meet the definition of a regulated firearm, then it would not be a, a replica. Understood. Thank so you. So that's the, the threshold then. Thank you. That would be the threshold. Seeing no more speakers, <coughs> uh, shall we vote on this uh, amendment? Um, all in favor of the amendment? Opposed? Carried. Thank you very much. Um, that being the case, um, so Point of order, you, Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead. I, I will be wishing uh, Mr. McGregor a happy birthday on behalf of this committee. Um, a little, I actually meant to say that before I got carried away with saying the motion was carried. I'm so excited with all the all the motions we've been passing in the last few minutes. But I, I do uh, also uh, join with you in wishing Mr. McGregor, and I expect the whole committee would like to wish Mr. McGregor a happy birthday. Yes. One, one more successful trip around the sun is always a good, good news, right? Thank you all. Um, okay, so uh, BQ2 cannot be moved because it affects the same lines. CPC2 cannot be moved. And that brings us to G5 in the name, I'm sorry? Oh, yes, of course. A very important part that I missed. Oh, yeah. Shall Clause 1 carry? Um, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay. So now, yeah, can't do that. Okay, now we go to uh, G5. 
um, which is standing in the name of Mr. Nur Muhammad and uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Muff. Um, thanks. Because my uh, colleague, Mr. Nur Muhammad, is, is not here right now, I'm going to do what Mr. Julian just did and move it on his behalf because I know it's an issue that both he and, and Mr. Shifke um, care a great deal about. Um, we've already passed one amendment to do with ghost guns or um, 3D printed firearms, or as the police call them, I think it's privately manufactured firearms. Um, we have a whole bunch of these, so I, I'm just so you know, Chair, I'll move them in, in Mr. Noor Muhammad's absence unless Mr. Shifke wants to move one. But this is, this is incredibly important for law enforcement. I hope <coughs> everyone can agree what these amendments are doing is adding the words firearm parts to um, different sections of legislations to ensure that uh, these privately manufactured 3D printed guns uh, are not able to be used in the commission of crime. Thank you, Mr. Moff. Is there any, anyone wish to speak to this amendment? Seeing none, let's have a vote. All in favor? Opposed? Uh, carried. Thank you all. We go now to uh, G6. Also standing in the name of Mr. Nur Mohammed. Um, my colleague, Mr. Shipke, wanted to move this one. <laughs> no, I think I... No? Okay. It's okay, Mr. Moff, you can move it. Okay. Um, similar to G5, this is uh, another addition of the words firearm parts. <coughs> um, so I won't talk about it a lot. I just did, so I hope that all of us can, can vote in favor of this one. Uh, Mr. Lloyd, go ahead. Yes, well, Conservatives uh, do support uh, expanding the maximum sentence uh, for those that commit crimes in relation to the trafficking of weapons and firearms. Um, we are deeply concerned about uh, the watering down of some mandatory minimums, and we do note that uh, nobody has ever actually received a maximum sentence. Um, so it is our hope that, uh, that we do see uh, stronger penalties for those who who commit these acts, which uh, are causing violence in our communities, which is uh, unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lloyd. Any other speak? Madam, uh, Mr. Moff, please. Just, just to quickly comment on that, legislation doesn't, uh, judges make the determination on the sentence, not elected officials. Uh, this, this does increase the, um, uh, the, I, I was incorrect about the, um, this does increase the sentence to 14 years from 10 years as it currently is, uh, associated with weapons trafficking. So I, my, my own personal cheat sheet was actually wrong in what I had written about it being ghost guns. This is actually increasing the, uh, the penalty to 14 years from 10 years. Thank you, Mr. Moff. Any further discussion? Seeing none, let us conduct a vote. All in favor of this amendment, please raise your hands. Opposed? Seeing none, carried. Thank you all. This brings us to G7, also in the name of Mr. Nur Muhammad. Uh, Mr. Moff, I believe, go ahead. I'm sorry, Chair, we just did G6, right? Yes. Okay. And G7, uh, similar to uh, the previous amendment, um, amends the criminal code offense of transfer without authority to include the transferring of a firearm part, which is all tied to um, ghost guns. Any, any discussion? Mr. Ruff, please. Just for the officials, so it's clear, I mean, we sort of discussed this briefly on Tuesday, um, and I know it's future, I think, amendments, but uh, if you, as long as you have, this isn't going to require to have an, an ATT to actually move the part, as long as you have your PAL or our PAL 
um, depending on the firearm, you're good to go, correct? That's correct. Thank you. Discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. That brings us to G8. Um, that also stands in the name of Mr. Nur Mohammed. Ms. DeMoff, please go ahead. Thanks, Chair. I think all of us who visited the, um, the RCMP gun vault were um, shocked at how fast and easy it is to um, 3D print a gun uh, or a receiver uh, and also uh, how readily available this is. So this, this clause um, sets about, um, deals with computer data and the computer system used in new offenses. So these, this is new. Um, it is extremely important for addressing the rise in, in ghost guns. Um, you know, back in the day, you needed a, a gunsmith to be able to create these receivers. And, you know, it was literally within moments that, uh, minutes, you know, while, while we were standing in the room that the 3D printing was able to, uh, to happen. So um, if, if colleagues have questions for officials to clarify this, but these amendments will deal with um, adding offences to deal with the 3D printing, it will also make Canada a leader in the world when it comes to addressing ghost guns. I, I, I met with, um, I mentioned this at our last meeting, but when I met with um, Inspector Michael Rowe in Vancouver, he said that these, these weapons are becoming, they are the preferred weapon for hitmen. Uh, they are becoming the preferred weapon of gangs, and it gives us an opportunity as legislators to actually get ahead of or organized crime instead of playing catch-up and give, um, give police the tools that they need to be able to prosecute those that are manufacturing these firearms, sometimes in a home in a residential neighbourhood. So I, I'm hoping that colleagues will support this amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moff. Mr. Lloyd, please go ahead. Um, I do have some reservations and questions about this. I'll ask officials. Um, is it clear, I mean, in a court of law, if you're in possession of something, I mean, just being in possession of schematics uh, for the construction of a ghost gun, I mean, there's nothing criminal about that. Um, so the government has to prove that the possession of these schematics is for the purpose of uh, of weapons tra trafficking, is that correct? <coughs> That's absolutely correct, yes. Yeah, because I've had a number of, you know, civil liberties uh, people and lawyers come to me and say this is, they're very concerned because, for example, um, if, if somebody had a manual for how to construct a, a regular, a conventional firearm that was even, you know, a legal firearm, like a legal design to be legal in Canada, um, you know, that's not what's being dealt with here, but you'd have to prove that they're planning... Uh, to distribute that schematic for the purpose of committing a crime. Or committing a crime. Correct. There are two elements to any criminal offense, the mens rea and the actus rea. Okay. And the mens rea in this case would be for the purpose of manufacturing. So just having simple possession of this, of a schematic, a drawing, et cetera, on your computer would not be captured by this, or the intent is not to capture it by this offense. You would have to have that additional uh, mens rea or the intent um, to for the purpose of, of trafficking, for the first offense. And the second offense, which would be the distribution of blue, blueprints, you would have to have uh, a mens rea of knowing that that blueprint or design or schematic would be used for the purpose of firearms trafficking. And it would have to be a firearm derived from the data. Is there any precedence in our law for something like this, that a design for something, yeah, that possession of a design for something, even if it is for a criminal, uh, proven that it's for a criminal purpose, is, is a crime? So in my review, I recall looking the closest um, offense I think that we came up with was the possession of, well, pos possession of child pornography. So look, uh, accidentally accessing it, accidentally um, looking at it or viewing it would, you know, you need a, the requisite mens rea. 
um, and possession is defined in the criminal code in, in section 4. Uh, so it really lays out what possession would be in those cases, um, and the courts, of course, would have. Um, Thank you for that clarification. Um, thank you. We go now to Mr. Julian, followed by Mr. Ruff. Mr. Julian, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll be uh, supporting uh, this amendment. I mean, uh, having uh, had the opportunity to meet with uh, the RCMP in, in Surrey, British Columbia, it was, uh, I think, an eye opener uh, to see the extent to which a 3D printer. Uh, with uh, the possibility of um, of uh, certain certain software, plus uh, legally uh, obtained firearms components um, obtained without a PAL, um, possession of ammunition, all of these things added together, uh, and law enforcement officials indicated how difficult it was uh, currently with the current law to do the, the appropriate follow-up. And as I've mentioned uh, many times, I know law enforcement has mentioned this as well, uh, the, the number, the increase of ghost guns in the streets across this country in certain regions, like mine, has increased exponentially over the course of the last year or two. This isn't an issue that is slowly developing. This is an issue that is exploding. 20,000 seized ghost guns in the United States and the Biden administration taking action. Uh, Canada needs to take similar action and equip law enforcement with the ability to crack down on criminals. And, and I, I think essentially uh, Bill C-21 is uh, becoming more of a, a bill that is cracking down on criminal behavior. Uh, these ghost gun provisions are vitally important to that. We have to crack down on criminals, cut off their source, and make sure that they do not have uh, untraceable firearms, that's a danger to the public. There is no doubt it's a danger to all of us. And so I'll be supporting this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Julian. Go to um, Mr. Conkin, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was uh, Mr. Ruff. I, I lost track. Mr. Ruff followed by Mr. Conkin. Thanks, Chair. Look, my question is very simple. I mean, look, I, I have no issues with the intent behind this uh, amendment at all. Uh, and, you, and I appreciate the clarification from the uh, officials to Mr. Lloyd's questions around the intent and everything. Has there been a charter statement done specific to this amendment? Because it obviously gets into the, some very gray, vague areas with all this lawyer stuff that I don't profess to be an expert on. So no charter statement was done specifically on um, this offense. Uh, the charter statement was tabled back in June of 2021, but we do do an analysis of, um, of all of our, all of the government motions, um, again, um, taking into consideration charter, charter impacts, such as on free speech, in terms of distribution of, um, of these types of um, blueprints. Um, so any charter analysis that would have been done is solicitor client privilege, but we can say that it wouldn't criminalize merely distributing or, or publishing, and it would not impact on free speech because you have to have the, the person has to have possession with an intent. So, so but you are clarifying uh, the charter statement was done on the original bill. This new amendment, uh, it wasn't, but there was analysis done. Fully acknowledging you can't share it, but you did a charter analysis was done on this amendment analysis that we do on motions, um, as I mentioned yesterday, gender-based analysis, uh, et cetera. Yes, we do do charter analysis on these provisions. And um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, on these, always. All, we always, yes, on every um, initiative uh, during our policy development. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cochran, followed by Mr. Shields. Thank you, Chair. Um, I actually, uh, like my colleague Mr. Ruff, I actually think this is the kind of stuff that we should be focusing on rather than going after law-abiding firearms owners, but that's just me. Uh, but I do have a, a, just a couple of questions about, uh, about this amendment. And from an I, like, so, I mean, yeah. So my, my, my last job before I came here was I was a tenured faculty member teaching computer systems technology at a local college. 
So IT is something that I knew, you know, I've forgotten more than I probably ever should have known in the first place. That was 17 years ago when the technology has changed immensely. But I don't see the word knowingly in 1021 or with intent in subsection 2. Um, I actually don't know what... I'm, I'm a former computer programmer, a systems analyst, a database administrator. I don't know what every file is on my computer. I, I su suggest that to each of you that are sitting down here as witnesses don't know every file that's on your computer. Shouldn't we have some kind of some language that says that you must knowingly have this on your, because it, it would be very easy, very easy for anybody with any technical skill whatsoever, and that's not me anymore, but it would be very easy for somebody to push, um, push a file to a computer, uh, push a bot, push uh, anything like that onto a device, and then all of a sudden you're circulating information uh, or your machine is circulating information that you have no idea that you're circulating. It happens when it comes to pornography. It can happen when it comes to technical plans for firearms. It, it's, it's so, like, I just didn't see the language. So can somebody reassure me that knowingly and with intent is part of this amendment? So I can appreciate the concern, absolutely, uh, around that kind of, you know, um, uh, what that type of concern around accessing uh, these types of schematics. Uh, for the sub one offense, which is the possession offense, um, it is that the person did it for the purpose of manufacturing. That is a well-known um, yeah, standard, is, that, that part, right. Okay. So the second uh, sub two, which is the distribution offense, has language in it that says, knowing that the computer data are intended to be used for the purpose of. So the element, the, the mens rea element is set out in that sub plus, and it is on two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, the eighth line. Okay, so the mens rea in, is there, the actus rea. Yes. The actus rea is actually doing that, yes, that um, activity. So <laughs> a prosecutor would definitely have to, um, proof that someone did do the sharing, making available, distributing the schematic for the purpose of, um, okay. for the purpose, yes. So those two elements would have to be proven. Um, I understand the concerns and I... Yep. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Mr. Shields, if you please. Thank you. Chair, sure. and mm -hmm. it's probably along a similar, and I think it's very important as we're moving this, and I think we're actually behind, not ahead, myself. Um, I saw high school kids making these things 20 years ago. Uh, what they could do with 3D printers was incredible then. So, I mean, I, I think we're behind. But I think this is going to get challenged in court, and I don't think it's tight. I think it's an attempt, but I think we'll lose because the bar is so high that I think you will get out of this one. But it's an attempt, and I agree with the attempt. But I think the charter rights lawyers, and it... it it probably will have to be dealt with again at some of the way, but the bar's too high and it, it's, I don't think it'll work. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Shields. Mr. Julian. Uh, I'd like to ask the officials then. I mean, uh, the, the department does uh, a vetting, including on under possible judicial challenges. Uh, does, this, does this hold up? So obviously, advice that we give to our ministers is protected by solicitor client privilege. But as um, my colleague has indicated, we do do a robust um, churner analysis of uh, all proposal, all draft legislation, including motions. But I can't give you a definite an like a I can't give you an answer to that without violating solicitor client privilege. But it, it is fair to say it has been fully vetted. It has gone through the approval process. Yes. Yeah, and and that includes uh, having having an analysis of what the impacts would be on, on, on the charter. So, whenever we draft legislation, we uh, provide our ministers and and decision makers with a full suite of analyses, both from a policy perspective and all le all relevant legal aspects. That that's important, I think, for committee to know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Julian. Uh, seeing no more speakers, let us carry out the vote. All in favor of this amendment? Opposed? Carried. This brings us to G9. Standing also in the name of Mr. Mohammed, who will um, be stood in good stead by Ms. Demoff. I know he's going to be very disappointed he didn't get to uh, move this and is 
colleagues will see I did my own little cheat sheet on how many were ghost gun amendments. And so these are all amendments that are adding the word firearm part. So G9 is the same thing. Already said what I needed to say. These are there are, are multiple of these. So hopefully we can go through them fairly quickly. Um, G, this one is adding firearm part uh, to importing and exporting. Um, so I'll leave it there. This is all existing legislation that just adds firearm part to it. Mr. Lloyd, go ahead. Um, I did read some of the transcript of the last meeting, but was there sort of a clarification on like part means an essential part, correct? Like are we, if somebody was talking about like a wood stock on its own, does that count as a firearm part? Thank you for the question. So at, uh, I believe a motion on Tuesday was um, all barrels and handgun slides as well as prescribed parts. So it is, is, it is limited to those, those pieces. So like essential components, okay, thank you. A receiver and a, sorry, may Go I ahead. add on to my colleagues? A receiver and a barrel are already um, determined as, or defined as firearms in Section 2 of the Criminal Code. Uh, the definition of firearm part in G3.2 or 3.2. Uh, 3.1. 3.1, sorry, um, adds these two additional barrels and slides. So those four, those four parts are going, or are, would be prohibited if this passes and carries today. No. No. Sorry. Not, Not prohibited, sorry would be firearm parts, would be firearm parts. Sorry, I apologize to the committee. Can, can, you, can you just repeat those real quick? So uh, receiver, a, f a frame and a receiver? Sorry, a frame, a, a frame and a receiver in section two is considered a firearm. Those two parts. If it got, yes, frame or receiver. Sorry, not a barrel. A barrel and slide would be Handgun slide. Handgun yeah. slide would be under firearm part, defined under firearm part. Yes. As firearm parts. Are we good? We're good? Okay. Right. Seeing no more speakers, let us at breakneck speed have another vote. All in favor of this amendment, please raise your hands. Opposed? Carried. This brings us to uh, G10. Also, in the name of uh, Mr. Nur Muhammad. So, uh, please. Thank you, Chair. Similar amendment, um, adding the words firearm part to give our police services and law enforcement the tools they need to combat ghost guns. Any discussion? Seeing none, um, let us have a vote. All in favor, say yes, or raise your hands. All opposed? Uh, carried. That brings us to the end of Clause 2. So, shall committee, shall, shall Clause 2 carry? All in favor? Shall Clause 2 carry? All, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. So that brings us to Clause 3, and I'm thinking that we have this excellent momentum. It might be a good place to stop, um, you know, to carry the enthusiasm into the next meeting, which will be Tuesday. Uh, is that to, to everyone's liking, that we uh, put, draw a line here? Mr. Julian, please go ahead. I, I would like to uh, propose a final time for unanimous consent, uh, uh, a request for an additional 20 hours next week for this committee, given how slow our progress has been. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll propose that again. It has to be adopted at unanimous consent. Do we have unanimous consent for? No, we don't. Sorry. In that case, never mind. We, uh, we have made enormous progress today, and I thank you all. And I thank you, I thank the, com the officials for, as always, giving us such excellent advice. And uh, with that, we are adjourned.
perfect. 